Why do I show this video and no factories? Because, as many of you know, when you go around in developing economies, there's a lot of work, a lot of logistical work getting from A to B, getting to a factory. And then I just wanted to show you some of the videos of actually just driving around in between factories. It's a lot of time. The factory just rolled up to my door and I just step out into the factory. Okay, I've got to organize the driver. That driver that took us around that day, this driver, it, uh, I pay 800 yuan. That gives me a driver for a day with petrol, maybe pay a tip, and then I've got this van for a day. And then I would pay those three girls that came with me, they are research assistants. I pay them for a day. They all come with me, they help hold the video cameras, they help do different things. It all costs money. Do I use research grant? No, I just use my own money. Why? Because this is what I love to do. Okay, so that's my emotional investment. So I, I enjoy that. Okay, let's move on to what it means for you. That's the, uh, by the way, this part here. We're just on the way to Shenzhen now, because we're gonna go visit three That's the border between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, but this is a new one that they built in not Lo Wu, but Lok Ma Chow. And there's a train that goes to Lo Wu and Lok Ma Chow. You've got to get, make sure you get on the right train. And normally that we get ask the driver to meet us on the other side of Lok Ma Chow station. And, that, and then we're off to the factory after that. And it's an hour or more to get to the factory. And uh, it's, yeah, so easy when you're in Hong Kong to do that. So that just give you an idea of that. So let's move on. All right, I want to show you another video because this is very important for today. All right, now this is going to Lo Wu, not Lok Ma Chow. All right, so this is another border crossing north of Hong Kong. All right, let's just turn that off a bit. It's very, you know, obviously, you know, there's a place for foreigners, there's a place for the locals to go through, and it's very efficient going through the borders uh, north of Hong Kong. Just millions of people go through there every day, one way or the other. Why am I showing you this? Because this is the day that I went to visit. Uh, this is Lo Wu, not, not Lok Ma Chow. This is the day we went through and we went to visit Passage Maker. Okay. Uh, so that's Lo Wu on the other okay. side of. We've just, yeah, we've just arrived at Passage Maker office now. Oh, whoops. Yeah. And uh, this is halfway towards Yanchan shipping terminal. So we just took a taxi there and that's where we are. So we're going to go and check out Fracture. I'm not sure if we can do a video on Fracture, but at least uh, you've got to go somewhere if you want to learn something. So we'll see you soon. This is not on YouTube, by the way, all right? This, and so this, going to Passage Maker. Now, what is Passage Maker again? What, uh, qu the question is, who is Passage Maker? Let me write it down, let me help you. Passage Maker. You've got your computer, you can look it up. And don't tell me it's a yacht company. Don't tell me it's a boat company. <laughs> All right? Passage Maker is a, starts with B. Come on. I've been talking about it for the last four weeks. Starts with B. Come on. Black box. Pardon? Black box. Yes! Black Box Factory! <laughs> so easy, isn't it? I've been talking about it every week, right? So now, here's the day we visit the black box factory. <laughs> Sorry, it's scary to answer my questions, isn't it? But I apologize. Okay. Are we awake? Are we ready? Yeah, good. All right. All right. So this is uh, Mike Bellamy's factory. You've seen him in the Udemy, but this is his company. Probably come from the same, yes, probably come from the same state. Yeah. So we're going to Passage Maker now and uh, go and check it out. This is St. Jen, great stuff. So it's all happening. Okay, so there's Mike. You, how many of you have seen Mike in the Udemy videos? Yes, okay. 
So this is his company, and we interview him this day, and he's got a big fish tank with a dirty, great big white fish that swims around. It's so funny. It's very nice. Okay. So what he is talking about is how he makes money as a black box factory. Black box means secret, secret factory. Write that down. Okay. Secret. Okay. Does that mean that the factory is invisible? No. It just means that if you want something secretly done, then that's the factory you need to use. And there's many ways of secretly doing something in China. Right, so let's go. That's his offices here. But now we drive to his factory, which is another, uh, it's about another 20 minute drive in Shenzhen. So during this drive, I talked to Mike about, okay, he's, he's managing up to over 100 people. How does he motivate them? How does he reward them? You know, it's, you've got to be very contextual and local to understand how best to manage people. The factory workers, do you have to provide accommodation for that one? And I bet the cost is probably the wage rate now in St. June is a little bit more than Malaysia factory rate now. Okay, so much higher. But it's actually even more expensive. It's hard to fire people in the Chinese law system. You have to have cause to let people go. And often the best way is, is just to wait until after Chinese New Year and a lot of them leave anyway after they get their bonus. Or if they got less bonus than expected, which you can do because their performance is underperforming, then you know that they're going to likely to leave. So voluntary uh, departure is the best way. So what we do is uh, we then we, we go to the factory. Uh, let's uh, go to the entrance. Remember, this is a secret factory. Wow. You have the whole dormitory? <coughs> Are you sort of renting that? All his employees live in here. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. So they made it. This is on your website, this picture. Okay. He doesn't have the ground floor. He has several. He's on the third, fourth floor of the building. Okay, here we are. We're at Passage We'll go in now. Industrial lift. This is more of a social board in the way in which they try and encourage and motivate their people in Passage Maker. And one more thing. Steffi's group, are you ready? Are you listening? Okay. Oh, sorry about that. That was, um, there it is here. That's what I wanted to show you. It's very, very important. Feel free to take pictures of general stuff, but if you see like logos, yeah, try to avoid that. I will. Absolutely. Yeah, that's important. 
just want to show you, this board here had all their profits, month to month. They show, in other words, the employees see everything. It's the only way for the employees to, to gain their trust as, uh, as a company in China, and that's what they do. They, and then they know they're going to get a share of the month to month profits and part of their bonus. Okay, bonus schemes work when, bonus schemes work when the computation is transparent, when you know how it is computed, with me, all right? If it comes out of a secret black box, it doesn't have as much motivational power, okay? So there's one group that's going to be talk, when we go into, I think about two or three weeks time, there's one group that's going to be talking about the scorecards that are used by the multinationals to manage their suppliers. And this is the, a topic that we're going to get onto. Okay? Let me remind you that, remember, global supply chain management, traditionally, we just talked about how does a multinational manage its suppliers. Okay? How we have approached this is, okay, let's just start from the individual, SME, and then we go to the multinational. Okay? And then you'll understand a little bit more of the operational challenges that you're going to have. Because one day, maybe one of you are going to be in a procurement team. And you know, your biggest challenge may be the guy or girl in engineering that keeps giving you trouble because they don't always agree with what you want to do with different suppliers. And you get headaches galore. All right? And you don't have the challenge of the law, IP, or black box. Why? Because the multinational has their big team of lawyers to take care of that. You with me here? So the multinational saves the law, you know, solves the law problem, but now it creates personnel problems. Okay? How does the procurement team manage the suppliers? Well, you're going to find all about that from group 10, is it? Group 10? Yeah, you're going to find all about that from them in a couple of weeks' time. Okay? So, just going forward. Now we're going back because we're at Passage Maker and it's a secret factory. And as you can see, I've just show. you know, I don't show all videos, but just... Do you remember that we have pool tables and foosball? Here's one thing when you go to a factory. How do you... How do you secretly know if the supplier is sourcing to another country? What's one way of finding out? Come on, I'd put your CIA hat on, okay? You've got to, you, when you go to a factory, you're checking it out for the first time. Aren't you like a private investigator? Am I right? Aren't you supposed to be trying to find out things that they don't tell you? Right? Because if you believe everything they tell you, you don't need to go to the factory. Okay? Yes, Steffi? Um, do you like see like, the logos and stuff on the boxes? Yes! 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 So you look out at the boxes and see if there's different logos for different for shipping to certain countries or different customers. And that's why Mike said, oh, just be careful when you're videoing. If you see a logo or something, you know, don't film it. Okay, remember this is supposed to be a secret factory. Okay, so the last thing I might do is a client gets a secret factory and then finds out that their logo shows up on YouTube six months later. All right, it's not good for business. All right? That's good news, Mike. Well, as long as uh, feel free to take pictures of channel stuff, but if you see like logos, yeah, like, try to go that. I will, absolutely. Yeah, that's important. Okay, so. Most factories have a lot of people on the production line and a small group in the front office to do the documentation. That's really nice when you get the same thing over and over again to keep your costs down. At our operation, we have almost for everything four people on the line. There's one person in the front office that's involved in preparing documentation and setting up the calls. Yes. 
Okay, so why am I showing you Mike? I just want to remind you, okay, we're going to talk about, this is one of the themes of tonight. One of the themes of tonight is how do you protect IP? Am I right? Like we talked about last week from a legal angle, but tonight we want to talk about it from a physical, how do you physically protect your IP? Well, use Passage Maker. Do I get a commission if you go to Passage Maker? No, no, all right. Okay, it sounds like I do, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Okay, but my point is, my point is that uh, we're going to look at how startups, how, do, how are startups successful, how are they successful in protecting IP? That's what we're doing tonight. How are they? If, you know, IP, physical protection. Okay, so how do startups do it? If, uh, do you have examples? And so that's what I do in the first hour tonight, talk about various startups that I've managed to interview with specific examples about how do they protect IP, all right? The, later on tonight, there's gonna to be two groups that will be presenting more on the startups and how they manage their supply chain. But of course, that's intertwined with how they actually manage their whole product and international marketing and you know, one is connected to the other in many, many ways. If you're on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, they're managing the supply chain and managing the marketing are sort of two of the one thing. And if you're studying international marketing, you need to think about that. Okay, you can't separate as one downstream, one upstream. All right, more about that later as the guys and groups are presenting. But let me wake you up again, because remember, this unit does not stand alone every week. So what did we learn in the first week? What was the big idea? Where to source. Macro ships. Where to source. Macro ships. What else? Trade war. Trade war. <laughs> okay, we're going to do something different tonight because you all look too comfortable. All right? Can everyone stand up, please? Well, if you take your time standing up, it's going to take forever. All right? Just up, right? Okay. Okay, we're all standing up, and we're going to go through this again. What did we learn in the first week? Macro shifts. Trade war. Okay. Where the source? Should, is it a China plus one? <laughs> Steffi, you're standing up and your hand's up, yes? The three circle framework, we introduced that. Very important. Okay, all right, my friend Ben Sinfordorf, who was on Bloomberg this morning, talking about the Belt and Road Initiative. Ah, that takes us to week two. What was the big idea in week two? China 2025. Belt and Road, but what part of the innovative framework are that were those initiatives? Uh, innovation framework. Remember the innovation framework? Remember, you got efficiency, R and D, the consumer markets, and at the top, government, government driven infrastructure slash R&D, right? Government driven, all right? So China 2025, the Belt and Road. The Belt and Road is huge. Tomorrow and the next day, there's a huge conference in Hong Kong. What is the name of that conference? Come on. <laughs> Have a guess. I just told you, what's the name of that conference? <laughs> what did I just say? <laughs> Hong, Hong Kong's having a big conference tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. The what? <laughs> the Belt and Road, yes. Oh, all right. I never ask you to tell me something I haven't taught you, okay? All right, all right, think. All right, so when to source, where to source. Okay, next, how to source. Week three, what was the big idea? Cost. Cost, cost was the big idea. And you've got to understand that because in week four, when we talk about negotiation, what is the last thing you focus on? 
price. You, you do not focus on cost or price, but what do you do instead? Ask you ask lots of questions. And those questions can be about cost, but your questions are empathetic. Thinking about Mr. and Mrs. Supplier, okay, I understand you've got this cost, but tell me, how are you making money based on this cost? Because I want you to make some money too. And it strikes me that maybe you're not making money when you're selling it to me at this cost. Can you tell me about your cost of materials? Can you tell me about your, are you with me here? You, uh, all right? So you're asking questions, you're asking questions. Because the last thing you might do is order from a supplier and then suddenly, like one of those factories, gone! Okay? It's gone. Okay? That happens. All right? So how do you develop a relationship? Ask lots of questions. Be genuinely interested in the business model of the supplier because it's their business model that needs to be sustainable. Which group is doing sustainability? They're not sure yet. Oh, they are. They're doing sustainability at the back. Okay, good. Glad. All right, so negotiation. Then last week, what was the big thing last week? Scams. Scams, yes. Why do we need to know about scams? In order not to fall into the scam. <laughs> In order how to scam others. Okay, good. All right, if you understand the worst that can go wrong, then you're in a better position to think about, well, okay, how do I approach the contract? Even if you don't know any legal stuff, all right? At least it keeps you in mind to ask the right questions, all right? To, so let's have a seat. Please, welcome, welcome. Okay, so remember... Three circle framework, we've already covered the first one. The big thing about structuring the relationship is about questioning, about questioning, questioning, questioning. Okay, the biggest takeaway that I could give you at the end of this course, remember you want to score well, if you could stand up and in 90 seconds just go through in 90 seconds, just go through the main ideas of this. Boom. Boom. Wouldn't that be powerful? Do you know what I mean? Like, that would be powerful for a job interview for a multinational. That would be powerful for if you're applying for a procurement position. That would be powerful if you, anyone asks you any questions about supply chain management. Okay? That would be a good thing for you to be able to do. All right? It's not about you know every detail each week, but you know the key ideas. You know the key ideas and your mind will look after the rest. Our brains are very good at filling in the detail once you know the key idea. Okay? Because you know in week three it's cost. Ah, then what does that mean? Oh, because supplies are under cost pressure, then they might try and take cut corners here, here and here. Ah. Are you with me? Then it all comes back, doesn't it? It's really easy, all right? But um, promise yourself to be able to, in 90 seconds, go through that, and we'll practice that at the start of each week. Good idea? Okay, remember, my job is to help you to be confident. So let's just go through to, not going through to the end. Three-circle framework. Okay, so where are we now? Last week we started with this notion of due diligence, legal documentation, but and you know ADR clauses, warranties, intellectual property is a big thing tonight. But I want to show you practically, rather than as a lawyer stand out in the front, you need to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, then you're protected. No, that doesn't happen generally in developing economies. Hmm. Huh? All right, so we must have another. What can go wrong? This is what you need to think about when you, before you do contracting. You know, think about what can go wrong. A scam can happen. Or the payment, they take your money. Quality, poor quality. Poor delivery. Delivery not on time. Miss the Christmas rush. What else can go wrong? 
intellectual property, designs, tooling, we're going to talk about that. You are the importer of record. What does that mean? What does that mean? Did we cover that last week? Importer of record means, for example, let's, uh, let's do a real example here. Hmm, not so hot today. But so, this is a very cheap AC adapter. How it's cheap? Because I, I bought it cheaply in China. All right, so I know it's cheap because I didn't pay hardly anything for it. Why? It's much, much cheaper than the, the Microsoft real deal that goes, that should be used for this surface. But sometimes when I turn it on and I'm charging up, this is charged now so there's no current going through, but when I make current go through it, it gets hot. It gets hot. So what do you think when I say, oh, something gets hot? What do you think? Starts with F. Fire. fire, yes. Heat, fire. Okay. Electrical currents create heat. All right. Poorly produced electrical equipment can create <coughs> excessive heat. Excessive heat, fire. If you're the importer of record, that means that's the first thing that lawyers go to to sue if a house burns down. Ah, that's what importer of records about. So please, 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 the last thing you want to be is importer of record. If you do not know what your product is. Okay. All right. If you're importing plastic spoons, then you're safe. All right. But just be careful. Anything electrical. Import of record. Wrong jurisdiction. We talked about that last week. What does that mean? That's where the case will be heard if you take a supplier to court, okay? Now, a lot of buyers in the US think, well, let's just put down my state in USA, but the problem is that it's very hard to get the supplier to go to the USA to go through the court case. That will never happen. So you've got to have it in the jurisdiction of the country that you are sourcing from. A non-ADR clause, all right? No ADR clause, that is a problem. It, Likely, what we talked very, very briefly on was alternative dispute resolution clauses. It's the only way to try and preserve relationships with suppliers. Because once you go to court, you lose the relationship. But ADRs is a way of preserving relationship and solving a problem. Okay, so write a now that you have all that in mind, there's a lot to think about. Now then you can start thinking about, okay, you write a contract with that in mind. All right, and as Mike would say in the Udemy, he talks about all of these things, and we talked about that last week. These are all the things that Mike has learned in the last 15 years, and basically it's the opposite of what I've just spoken about. Ah, okay, so what about, what about tooling for injection? We talked about tooling as a way of how suppliers can pull the wool over your eyes. You with me? Because they cannot hide labour costs from you, they cannot hide material costs from you, but they can hide the cost of tooling from you. Am I right? Okay, so, wait a minute. Okay, so I just want to show you. We're still in the factory, and I'm just going to show you what it looks like from the injection loading machine. So just go around, turn around. Here. All right, this is the factory that makes the that makes the you know the Xbox game controller. Okay, so they're the injection molding machines there. Okay, but this is what the tooling looks like. That's the tooling there, or the molds. That's what we mean by the tooling. That is where suppliers can tell you that, oh, the tooling costs us 100000 when it only costs them 60000 They can lie to you. Very easy. Number two, the suppliers can make your run one day. Then you go home. Your auditor goes home. Then they, the supplier says, oh, let's just do another run for myself on the second day. And let's not tell the buyer. Can they do that? Easy. Just put that in into the crane. 
and start up the injection molding machine again. That's, they do that. So what I did say is one way of protecting is how. All right, so how do you protect against that? How do you stop a supplier secretly using your tooling? Huh? Uh, you own the tooling, but some of them own the tooling, and the tooling is still at the suppliers. So, what else can you do? Yes, sir. Take it away. Yes, yeah, so you have a tooling steward. That is, companies provide a service where you pay them money to pick up the tooling when your production run is finished, take it away, and when the production run wants to run again, you bring it and off, off you go. Okay, but obviously this supplier on this day, okay, had lots of tooling there, just all stacked up, obviously for many, many different buyers. Ah, okay, now, granted, you may trust this supplier, why? Because they supply to Microsoft. Okay, and you think, okay, if they do something wrong by me, I'll contact Microsoft and complain to them. You know what I mean? Their reputation. So there's many different ways that you can get leverage on supplies. But of course, this type of supply is going to be expensive for you. All right, enough of that. Let's just keep moving because I, I just want you to think about protecting IP. What are we doing? Three things again. Remind you of what we're doing. A more sustainable supply chain, driving innovation change, and the rise of the hardware startup. The theme going through all of this is, you know, how do we get improvement and change in the supplier's factory? Even if we are a little person. Multinationals, we're going to talk about that in weeks to come. But what if you're a little person? How do you do that? And how can you make a difference? So here is the big, two big questions. What are the challenges facing the management of suppliers which are likely to impact SMEs, startups, management of the supply chain? So I, I went and interviewed many, many consultants. And this is what they told me. Big ideas, this person in charge of big ideas, he is now the global supply chain manager for GAP. How many of you know GAP? Okay. So he looks he's back between Hong Kong and Milan just about every, uh, every week. Okay. And so he was telling me the following, that it's about frequency meetings, visiting factories, and also you need to understand or fight, win the heart and mind of suppliers. That was his big advice. And again, it sounds like our week four negotiation, it's all about thinking about the total value you've been creating. Rather than moving information, it's about trying to create value together, uh, rather than the, them against us. All right, what, are, what was he doing in consulting and giving advice to large firms? He was telling them all, most of them generally, to consolidate the supplier base. Because some of them had 80, 100, 150 suppliers, and it just got out of, out of control. And I've only managed to visit only 50 factories, and it's taken a long time. If you have 150 suppliers, then you go frequently visit. It's a lot of work. Okay, Weave. How many of you have heard of Weave? They're a international consulting firm in the area of garment and fabric manufacturing. Weave. Okay, Weave. Uh, you, you got it. Uh, good. All right. Good. You good. All right. So what did they say? Well, the big challenges they found was managing capacity, all right, lowering the mar margins, and volumes are fragmented. They're fragmented because sometimes the consumer markets, they want all different fancy colors. And you can no longer go to suppliers and say, oh, Mr. Supplier, can, we, can you do a 20,000 run of these socks or these shorts or shirt, one color? No. It's, oh, can you do 500 run of this color, 400 of this color, 400 of this color? And you just get these small volumes because driven by consumer markets. Because what is being sold in the next three months is not going to be sold in six months. And then orders change all the time, very frequently. That was one big thing that was coming. 
uh, Weave was talking about. Tell Apparel. How many of you have heard of Tell Apparel? Remember, this is advice I've got from consultants about well, how do you manage suppliers? What did Tell Apparel tell us? Well, it's for, a lot of it's about inventory management. It's about inventory management and understanding that, you know, poor inventory management costs a lot of money, okay? And generally, in the retail markets, there are higher costs, but also lower retail prices. The big challenge in, we're getting away from electronics at the moment, we're moving over to apparel and everything, and you go into clothes shop now. Generally, the traditional model was, oh, when you first come out with a new design, then you can sell it at 100 US dollars, and then you can mark it down, you know, six months later down to 70, and, and then you can send it off to, a, to the factory outlets for 30 US dollars 12 months later, you know what I mean? But now those new designs are going into the store and consumers are not willing to pay more than 50 US dollars for the same thing. And you don't have that, you know, that price competition right at the beginning of the first time a new design comes out is so much higher pressure now compared to four or five years ago and more. All right, so that was a big thing that Tal Power was talking about when they're talking about the lower retail prices. Retail price erosion through endless promotions. And then finally, we've told us three big trends. Total cost of ownership. Okay, what is the actual total cost of actually managing a supplier, making something, then delivering it, and then just that whole cost. When you talk about total cost of ownership, we want to think about every, the cost of doing everything in the supply chain and the design to cost and production planning. Okay, so what do we mean by design to cost? How many of you have heard that before? This is one thing I want you to think about. Design to cost, what does that mean? Uh, product development costing. It's, it, yeah, it's at that stage, correct. Designed to not be so complicated. Like how much it costs for a prototype? Or, you think about the costs. For example, how many of you have bought a car before? A car, a car, you know? The... All right, you know what a car looks like, so it's a good example. All right, so, but every one of you have different preferences. So those that are buying a Toyota, they may not have a preference for a very strong motor compared to those buying a maybe a BMW or a, another car. Are you with me? So Toyota know that, so then they don't they make sure that their motors are d designed not as strong because people are not buying they're buying it for the efficiency, not for the grunt torque at the traffic light. Are you with me here? So they're designing it. They're designing cost out of the production. Why? Because they know their market is not asking for something that they want to build into the product. Okay? Or you may, you know, Lexus, maybe their seats are better because the people that buy the Lexus, they want to have nice, comfortable seats compared to another brand. You with me? So then Lexus will actually design that in. But you, you with me here? So they they, they design in the expensive items only for those consumer markets where the consumers are looking for that expensive part of a car. And that's what we mean by design of car. This is, this is huge. This is huge. It came out of automotive, but it's now very, very big in fashion now because they realize that fashion is so fast now, so now they make buttons that are much cheaper unless you're shipping to Australia where the buttons that you make for any garment has to have four holes in it because that's the Australian law. But if you're shipping to another country, well, buttons with two holes will be enough. Okay? That, that's... Yes, Steffi. We just break down the cost of everything that makes the product and then you actually rate all of those different features against what the consumer markets value. Consumer markets don't value nice padded seats, 
then let's just put in some basic seats in the car and save 100 US dollars on fitting out that car. Are you with me? So you're actually map, you're mapping the design of the product to what the consumer market is demanding. Ah, okay. Because remember, design at the end of the day is giving what the market wants. Okay. When you design thinking is all about starting with, well, what do you want, and let's work backwards from there. Okay. Yes, sir. No, you've got to listen to the market and find out why, why do people buy the car, why do people buy the product? And maybe there's a special item for why people buy that product. Apple, when they first came out with their iPhone, they were using Gorilla Glass. That was very, very important for the iPhone. It wasn't other phones at that time. But the Gorilla Glass cost a lot more money than ordinary glass. But they still kept it in there. Yeah, no, this, this is a little bit more sophisticated than that. This, is, uh, this has been a little bit smarter about which parts of the product should be low cost. Let's just make sure that the part of the product that the consumer notice is not low cost. And the things that the consumer doesn't notice, oh, we'll make them low cost. If it doesn't change the functionality of the product, good enough. Okay, enough. This is good. This is... Uh, production planning matches the right time of the year. These are three. These are big ideas we got from the consultants. Now I've already told you about this notion of China manufacturing consultants. If you go to their website, you can learn so much from them about how to manage a factory. Uh, why am I doing this? This is kind of like a management accounting information that helps. But I asked. Uh, one of the founders of China Manufacturing Consultants, I know, know them all, I said, tell me, you know, give me in one paragraph, what are the big challenges for factories in developing economies? And he said, oh, that's easy. Number one, uh, the leadership. Okay, number two, the skills, awareness, the best practices. And number three, the short-term mindset. Okay. And often very opportunistic. That is, if there's a property going for a million dollars and there's a machine you have to invest in that's a million, it's more likely let's invest in the property. Okay? All right? And that's what happens when you have a short term mindset. And, you know, that's pr pretty common of owners of Chinese factories. I'm not sure about other countries. Any comments on that? Okay. How do you save money? I told you this, the big three, very quickly. You cut inventory, cut office staff, and process improvement. That's it. Okay, so there you have five pages of what consultants have told me about, well, how can they fix factories? How can they turn around factories? By knowing this, this Okay, how does this help you? This can help you think about how a multinational can improve its efficiency if you join a procurement team. This can help you think about when you go into a factory beyond what you learnt last week and the week before when you did the presentations, not just looking for, ah, oh, they don't have an anti-static wire on their wrist or, ah, oh, they should have the suction machines for the fumes coming from the soldering and this person not sitting well. More than that, this takes you one step further. How can you make the factory even more efficient? And I spoke to one guy that was in charge of sourcing for Avery Dennison. Do you know Avery Dennison? They make the badges for, they make tags, badges, really big. I said, What's one thing that factories could do to improve overnight? He said, oh, that's easy. There's one thing that all factories can do is just start measuring, start measuring their electricity and measuring their water. Like, they all use electricity. They all use water, but they don't measure it. Bill? Yeah, they get a bill, but they don't see that as connected to their operations. 
They don't see how, you know, it's okay for them to think, oh, let's just keep the machines running because we've got all this labor and even though we don't, let's just make inventory because, <coughs> well, another order hasn't come in. Oh, let's just, uh, the people who are here to work today, oh, let's just run the machines for another six or eight hours. Thinking, well, what, the machines don't run on electricity? They're free? Nothing's for free. Once you start having that mindset of measuring everything and they are all attached to costs, then you start to think differently about, well, maybe it's better we shut the factory down for one day a week. Even if we have to pay wages, at least we don't have to pay overhead, and at least we don't have to use up material to go into inventory that we won't be able to sell. Ah, so it's just a, a mindset that uh, we've got to think about. Look, I'm not going to go through this, but you know, this is a lovely uh, diagram that China manufacturing consultants put together and think about, well, often the root causes of problems in factories, in suppliers, your suppliers start with training, incoming material, production planning, equipment maintenance, and process control. Usually a one, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right. So if you're working for a multinational, you're going to come across uh, these problems. Maybe your, your, your first three month probation in our procurement team or a team in a multinational is, well, you know, we want you to analyze our supply chain and suggest some improvement. Well, maybe you need to come back to some of these slides to think about where do you start? Because this may be a good place to start. Okay. What do I mean? Where, like, where do you start? Well, number one, this diagram is a good way of asking questions. Okay, you've just started for a multinational, you've started your new job, and they've given you a project. And then you say to your re person you report to, listen up, class, all right? I'm not giving you theory, I'm giving you real stuff you should do, you can do in your future employment if it's in involved with a supply chain. This is a real thing you can do. You can look at that, it's not about memorizing. You use that to prompt questions that you can ask your direct report. Questions like, first of all, very easy question, could all of these say, oh, do you, um, out of all these, what, what are you measuring at the moment? Are you, are you measuring this? Oh yeah, we're measuring that, are you measuring that? Yeah. Um, Okay, late shipments. How many late shipments have we had in the last three months? Right? Once you start measuring things, then we can start to figure out, well, what's our current situation? And then we figure out how the situation can change. Ah, you with me? So this is not theory. This is a framework for asking questions about, well, what are you measuring? What are you not measuring? Ah, ah. practical, practical, very practical. Okay, so that's a sum this is my summary of my talking to consultants. That is often, and we're going to come back to this in a couple of weeks' time, often multinationals, uh, they just want to do number two. That is, they just want more efficient, more efficient, more efficient. Cost down, cost down, cost down. All right? Better, stronger, faster, but it's got to be cheaper. Ah. But they don't think about, well, we need to think about the hearts and minds of the supplier, which is much more important for long-term sustainable sustainability, though the group looking at sustainability, very, very critical here. And what can you do overnight in terms of act, practical actions if you've got to do things and you're a new manager? Well, initially, you could start consolidating the supply base, that is, thinking about which suppliers we want to cut, okay? And then we start, start to measure, start to measure what suppliers are doing, okay? And how well is, uh, are we collaborating with the suppliers? Ah, okay, so two big frameworks, I think this one, number one, and this one, number two, to think about as a summary of uh, what I've learned from consultants. Okay. It's now eight o'clock. We're going to have 
three minute break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about the rise of the hardware startup and particularly with respect to the IP. If IP is so important, how do the startups manage their IP? Because startups do not have a team of lawyers. Multinationals have that. Very easy for the multinationals to manage their IP. Okay, we're going to learn all about that in weeks to come. But what do you do when you're a startup? You've got this idea that's going to change the world. You've got this idea that's going to make you millions of dollars. And if that word gets out, leaked, whatever, gone. Like, that's the startup world. It's cutthroat. Your ideas are no longer profitable once someone else finds out about them. You're with me here, all right? That's the challenge, okay? So break for three, four minutes. Everything okay? Huh? One more go. No problem. Excellent. May I have your attention, please? Ah, in the root directory, is it? Okay. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Your attention, please. Okay, we're going to play a little game now. Very short game. Because at 9 o'clock, just before 5 to 9, we're going to have our two groups present. Basically, we're going to assign about... 25 minutes for each group. And that means they don't present for 25, but let's just sort of, you know, have that leeway so we don't go over time. Okay. All right. So I'm going to show you something, and then you need to tell me one word, the first word that comes to your mind. And you need to yell it out. Okay? Pardon? Nothing. No, it's about products I have purchased from China. I'm going to show you the product, and then you're going to show, you're going to tell me the first word that comes to your mind. You ready? Okay. I've got a lovely product here. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? No, that's, <laughs> it's a power bank. I know that, but what's the first word that comes to your mind? Sand, yes. Sand. Sand, come on. You remember last week, right? Sand. Don't they get it? Exactly. All right. So, you know, you think power bank, you think sand. All right. You with me here? All right. Okay. I'll show you one more. I'll show you another thing. All right. All right. Oh, here's a wonderful USB. It was given to me by CPA Australia. All right? So, what do you think? <laughs> Scam? <laughs> Maybe. Is it lifetime warranty, sir? <laughs> Life lifetime warranty? Scam? What else? What if it really works? Then what's the, what comes to mind? Low storage. Low storage? Or what if the storage is what is promised? No, it's free. It's free. I got it for free. Slow. slow. It's slow. The read-write speed might be very slow. And how do I know if it's slow or fast? Okay. Then one day I'll plug it in for a presentation and it may not work. You don't know, you know? Okay, all right. So we're, you're learning something, all right? So you've got to... i show you products and you need to know... Questions need to come to your mind when you see a product, all right? 
All right? Third one. Are you ready for the third one? Third, last one, then we move on. Okay? Uh, let me see. Let me... You know, it's sort of like a... You know, we're, we're trying to sell you things, eh? We've got this wonderful, cheap AC power... <laughs> what? Yeah, good, okay. All right, fire, okay? All right? <laughs> okay, cheap electrical power, fire, okay? All right? USB, not count, catch fire, but you, you're plugging this into your 240 volts, okay? You've got to think, fire, okay, great. Good, good, good. All right, so that's our, that's my testing for you today. All right, good. The rise of the hardware startup. Wow, fantastic, exciting. How, how big is it? Like, like this is over 12 months old. How many of you are, any of you studying IoT as part of your major project? Wait a minute, half this group is and half this group isn't. Am I right? Who's the leader? So are you studying IoT startups? Huh? Okay, all right, good. All right, so maybe you, a beginning is that you go back to CB Insights and update this table. What does this show you? This shows you the unicorns. What is a unicorn? Something over a billion dollars US. Of course, Xiaomi since did a, a listing on Hong Kong stock market. They came in at 20, I think the IPO price around 20. Now it's below 10. Okay, so it's price now is only about 22, 23 billion US, but its valuation before it listed 46 billion. Okay, DGI, big maker of drones, Menzu Technology Hardware, Royale Corporation, hard Royale, yes, hardware. All right, so what is special about these unicorns? Something special about these unicorns is the owner. What was the big idea I gave you? It's going to come up next week. Where are our groups who are presenting next week? I'm, I'm cryptic here. Okay, who's doing the earphone? The earphone? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So, we're going to learn all about earphones next week. Anyway, what was special about, you're going to talk about next week is the owner, right? Okay. The owner of Royal Corporation very, really impressed me because I talked to one of their representatives. This is Sabrina, and this is what Royal makes. They make the 3D goggles. You put them on, immersive, okay, 3D reality, wow, okay and you put everything on. Okay, but his, the owner's mindset is not about, it's not about those goggles. It's about one day, he's thinking one day that you'll, you'll get this bottle of water and it'll have an LCD screen around it and then you'll just put it on there and then suddenly this advertising will appear. Uh, but isn't it that, uh, that's what the average person says. Isn't it going to be expensive? No. At the moment, the display industry is worth 150 billion. That's 2016. But flexible displays are going to double that in the future. It's going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And you get a coffee mug with an LCD screen on it. And people will give it out to you. Why? Because that coffee mug will, st will tap into the Wi-Fi and then it will just show advertising. Your phone won't be the only place that has an LC, LCD screen on it. And but, no, but I'm just saying, right or wrong, all right, this is what the owner is seeing. This is the vision of the owner. Class, class. The big thing that you need to take away, not only this week with startups, but next week, from this group here, I can see this group are very excited to present next week. <laughs> uh, like this. I can't wait the next week. I can't wait. Because one of the owners of the factory just 
blew me away, all right? And it's, it's their mindset, it's just their vision for the future. They're not just thinking about making money from their next factory run. They're, they're thinking about the future, all right? This owner is not thinking about this as their product. They're thinking about this display industry. I, I read one of the articles about this owner. He just invested 1.8 billion, billion, not million, okay, in a heavily automated factory. Like, the average owner does not do that. That's what makes startups different from a factory. The two groups you are presenting on startups tonight, I hope that comes out through that. All right, what else do we learn? I learned a lot from all of these, interviewing a lot of these. I think one group talking, to, you got Nanoleaf, is that right? Okay, so I won't bother you with that. But here are the different ways in which startups have managed, what are we doing? The theme tonight is how do we manage IP? How do we manage IP? The best way to learn is to learn from startups because they are likely to be the entity that is most exposed to IP risk. Because they got an idea, they're new, it's not new, all right? No startup is in the business of just making low margin, you know, high volume of, of copies, all right? So the first one, how many of you, I think one of you are doing this one? This is Elodie. This is a Lodi. So what do they do? They make a little device that you touch on your skin that tells you how much moisture is in your skin. Ah, but it's more complicated than that because the F, you know, under the uh, FDA laws in USA, the med medical laws, that you cannot have a capacitor touching this, the body of a human. An electrical device can't over capacitor. Okay, now I've got a smart watch here, but and the, the capacitors underneath is what reads your heart beat. Okay, but you have to have a special protect, protector between the, the capacitor and the skin. Ah, you know, so, you know, these things can, anything that touches the skin gets very complex, all right? In the design and the idea. And so this is a Taiwanese owned startup. And so they had a partner in China. And the joint venture partner in China said, oh, we want you to move from Taiwan to China. What would you do? What's the biggest risk? The IP. The IP. What did they do? They moved it partly. They no. Made they didn't move to China. They actually moved it to Thailand. They moved the factory to Thailand. I said, why'd you move there? You know why they moved there, all right? Protect IP, okay? So, factory location. We talk about trade war and factory location. No, 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 trade war, small thing, all right? Factory location for a lot of these companies, sometimes it's about protecting IP. It's not about the labor costs or trade war all the time, okay? Protecting IP. All right, next idea. Remember, we're going through six. When I'm done, I'm done. And then we have our group present. Number two, all right? Because I get you all to stand up and tell me what are those six reasons why Six ways to protect your IP. Okay, not right now, but in a minute. <laughs> okay, get ready. <laughs> all right, all right. Goji Tech, Matthew, my friend. Matthew, I've uh, interviewed him many, many times. And what does he make? Like this, and this was on uh, Kickstarter. You raised Indigo over first. Indigo go in thirty thousand k. Yes, that's right. Uh, US dollar. Yes. And then what have you done after that? So after that, I uh, shipped the product in September. So it's fully shipped out and everything. How many different. backers? Uh, we have two hundred something backers. Two hundred. So everyone was very happy with the product and no major issue. But during the same time, we also developed. Okay. First of all, what is this product? It's like, it's like a man bag or it's a bag, but it's got a battery inside. It's got one of these inside. Sand, <laughs> okay, all right? It's got one of them inside, all right? 
and it made a big one, but he found that, oh, the US people, they don't like this, it's too manly for them. So he made a small one for the US market, the European market, they like a bigger bag. It's in Bonjour. Yeah, yeah, correct. All right, so what, how did he protect his IP? Because he owned a factory in Dongguan, making leather goods. He also owns a charming pop brand that sells uh, handbags and various accessories to females in Hong Kong. Charming pop, okay, several shops. And so because he had a factory for that, it was easy for him to use that factory, like a secret factory, to protect his IP. So he got the supplier to deliver the sand, all right, to the factory, you know, the power bank came in, the supplier didn't even know what the power bank was going into, and then he was able to combine that with his pouch. Okay, with the bag and to make it. All right? Secret factory. That's how he did it. Number three. Number three. Grom. Everyone say, everyone say Grom. Oh. I'll tell you what, if the owner of Grom was here, it would be so sad to hear that. All right? It sounds very leechy, you know. Grom. All right? Come on. Grom. Oh. Okay, that's bad. Okay, what does Grom do? Grom... They make, it's all about, it's all about, a, do you know what a podiatrist does? Like a single chair for a single person. A podiatrist is a practitioner that does what? A podiatrist. A podiatrist. Come on. Yeah, your feet, yes. Okay, so you go to the podiatrist when you have feet problems. Okay, and so then they might make a special mold for you. So what does Grom do? Grom, they make 3D printed molds to put in your shoe. How do they protect their IP? Ah, you can answer this one now. Okay, remember, what is the product? It's, it's an insert to go in your shoe, but it's 3D printed insert. 3D printed, so digital. How do they protect their IP, that digital product? By the way, they have a factory in China. Do you need to protect software that much? Pardon? Do you need to protect software? On the same That's way? a good question. Why do you ask that question? Uh, the, the question is... Oh, <laughs> do you need to protect software in the same way? Uh, As what? hardware. Yeah, like, do they have because here it's software, so... It's, the, it's digital, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. We still need, it's... But they have programmed the 3D printers, so... Yes. That's hard to just steal or copy. No, any 3D printer can actually make these. Yeah, you can copy. Yeah. Talk to Dr. Data. You can copy. Dr. Day just coming. Relax. Okay. Dr. Day just coming. All right. 3D printers. You don't go for patent printing. Now, I want you to think about this. All right. And I won't ask you to take your shoes off. But what if we all stood up together and we took our shoes off and we wiggled our toes and, and we looked at everyone's feet? Would, are they all the same? No. no. That's it. That's it. That's how they protect your IP. Because there's no digital copy that is the same. Every digital copy is different. So there's no... Done. All right? Because it's customized. All right? So every feed is different. Okay. How many have we done now? We've done three? Four. Customization is a way of protecting your IP. You know, it's so customized. One foot. All right? Are you doing eye dummy? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I'll skip over this one. Have you got videos for it? Yeah, it's an electronic manicure. Yes. Have you got video for it? Yes or no? No, no, no. Why not? In the Udemy, it was, you talked about one of the companies, so I just made a note. Are you pres is it one of your IOTs? No, 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 no. Oh, then just let me do it. All right. So, iDummy, how do they protect their product? Behind the scenes.
seeds of the garment industry. Okay, what is the product? It is an electronic mannequin that you, you, you put in the coordinates of a particular male, female, whatever, and then the mannequin will change according to those coordinates. Okay? All right? It was designed by researchers at Hong Kong Polytechnic University in Hong Kong. And so they had to expand. Why? Because they didn't have manufacturing facilities in Hong Kong. It, there wasn't, it was not efficient to do that in Hong Kong, so they had to do it in China. So how do they protect their IP? Like this product here is 20,000 20, US dollars for a product. Okay, like it's expensive, but it can be copied. Cheaper copies could be made. So how do they, how do they protect their IP? How did they do it? License, maybe. Do you get suppliers to sign a, a non-disclosure agreement? Uh, okay, let's let's be clear here. Let me play this, but... The question is, can we get a supplier to, supply to sign a non-disclosure agreement? Okay, non-disclosure agreements work when you have a team of lawyers to back it up. All right? Do the startups have teams of lawyers? No, so it's very hard to, like, yes, you want to do that, even if you don't have teammates or lawyers, but that's not something that you can rely on, all right? And that's why we, when we look to startups, that's why we can learn so much. How have they innovated their protection of their IP? Ah, okay, so how has this one innovated? They innovated it through ownership. So they had a, they set up a joint venture with the factory in China that, that makes swimwear, okay, relationship maybe, all right, swimwear, and so now that factory has a joint equity share in their whole product. So they do it through ownership. Ownership is one way of protecting your IP, rather than contracting out, licensing, things like that. Okay, so that's number four, ownership, okay, equity ownership, okay, and there's, there's your mannequin and it, it can just change according to whatever coordinates like you've got a USB cord that comes out from the bottom of the mannequin you plugs into your computer and then you make all the adjustments ah okay that's number four ownership all right what was number one how did pardon second no joint venture yeah in Thailand still China. okay all right Thailand country right number two Factory. Secret factory. Number three. Customization. Customization. Number four. Ownership. Okay, now we're getting there. We're doing very well here. All right. Number five. Ambi climate. This is really, really interesting, this one. Julian Lee. Hi, Julian. Finally, got to meet you. Yeah. Wonderful Ambi Labs. They've been around. All right, so Julian Lee, Ambilabs, they make this little device that help um, connect, it's a smart device, connect your iPhone to your air conditioning, basically. So you can control things, right? Okay, so it's sort of like a intermediate type product. All right, so how did they, so they got factories in China to make it, but they did three steps. Number one, they did an in-house design and they kept the prototyping made, they made it 100 units by hand in Hong Kong. So they, they get ejected, molded plastic covers and all that done in China, then it's sent over to Hong Kong, then they assemble it with the elect electronic products all together in Hong Kong, they assemble and they make a hundred. Okay, why do they do that? Because they want to show people and they have start marketing, promotion, things like that. Ah, then they go to number two, and this is really interesting where they use soft tooling. Soft tooling is the use of metal tooling molds that will wear out after 5,000 molds, 10,000 molds, rather than 100,000 or 200,000. You with me here? Okay, so it doesn't last forever. The supply cannot jinx it and, and keep on doing, making what you don't want made. All right, so they had no time to do the full selection process. So how did he find a factory in China that would have the soft tooling and make 500 units. Ah, let me introduce you to John Bunford. 
when did that end up now? That uh, well, so we decided not to go forward with the production right All right, so this is John Bunford, and he is basically an expert in Raspberry Pi. How many of you know what was Raspberry Pi is? One, two, Raspberry Pi. Jenny? Okay, Raspberry Pi is like Python for electronics firmware. And basically, it's a software engine of firmware that runs microcircuits and things like that, right? And animatronics. Yeah, well, this guy here, he does animatronics too. So, very smart guy. Anyway, so, okay, listen up, listen up. Remember, how do they protect your IP? All right, so, how do you, how do you go from Hong Kong? I want to protect. All right, we've got physical protection, but now we've got to go to the great, we've got to go to China, but how do we get to a factory to start with that we can trust? Well, John Bunford, the community, suggested this factory to Ambi Climate to use. Ah, so go to the community, use the community to get access to a factory you can trust. Ah, okay, and then after they did 500 units, they went to a bigger factory and that's where they got professionals in to get the right factory. But by then they knew that they've already prototyped their product, they've already tested it, they've already raised money for a campaign and so forth. You with me here? All right. So you went stage one, two, three, and not until three that they're really opening up the world to, here's our idea, please don't steal it. You with me here? Okay, so one, two, and then three. Ah, so staged, a staged approach to reaching out to a factory, but not before you've actually shielded the first stage and the second stage. Ah, okay, finally, Number six, is it? Yeah. Rotorex. Oh, this is fantastic. Rotorex, and we've just got enough time for Rotorex. Good. All right. Rotorex, they make racing drones. <laughs> you know, right? You know, well, drone. All right, and you put the goggles on, and you, you, right, you understand. Okay, so, but they don't make pleasurable drones. It's all about racing, just racing, racing, like high end stuff. Okay? All right, so. They developed this atom. I think they made money by raising money on Kickstarter, Indiegogo. They raised uh, nearly 200,000 on Indiegogo. Anyway, so they had to get a factory in China to make the drone. Ah, so what is the IP of the drone? A lot of it was in the motor, but more of it was in the propeller, the design of the propeller. Ah, so what do you do? You separate. You separate. You don't get a factory to make everything. One factory makes one, one factory makes two. You put that together. Ah, that's what they did. But that's not how they protected their IP. Something else happened. Because a factory that wasn't allowed to make the rotors, they got the rotors and then reversed engineered it and found out how to get the right mold. And then that factory started making those rotors and putting them onto other drones. All right? So the cat's out of the bag. The IP's out of the bag. All right? They, they tried to separate, but it failed. Then what happened? Their whole drone community found out that these propellers were being sold by another distributor, and they... The owners of uh, Rotorex, they got into the community and told the community, this, this is a copy, don't buy this. And the community actually brought shame on that factory. And then the factory came back to Rotorex and said, oh, sorry, we're sorry, we're not going to make any more of these propels again. Can you please just allow us to continue to make the motors? All right, so community shaming. Can you believe that? Community shaming became the protector of the startup. Wow. That's it. That's it. Oh, finally, Tech Packer, but Tech Packer is more of a uh, software as a service where you, you've got a Tech Packer is basically anyone in garment industry, there's a number for everything. Number for a collar. This is like a 54 design collar. 
you've got a 48 design collar and there's a button, there's, there's a number for everything. What Tech Packer does is put all those numbers into a software so then you can just tell a factory, I'd like a number 58 collar on a 38 button on a sleeve of this one and that one. And so the factory knows exactly what those codes are and then suddenly, boom, the factory can make what you want. All right, that's what Tech Packer does. All right, so that's a software as a service. So it's, it's not an IP protection as such. Yes, sir. Uh, so all this has a direct impact on the outsourcing activities as well, right? This actually speeds up the outsourcing because now you don't need to visit the factory to tell exactly what the designs you want. Because you go into the software and say, oh, I like this design, I want that collar, I want that cuff, I want that zip. And then the factory knows because Tech Pack is basically a coding system for the garment industry. That's why they call their their startup Tech Packer. Okay. Now, does that protect from IP? Not directly, but I thought I'd throw that one in there because I interviewed them. All right. And then finally, you got Brink. All right. So let's just summarise what we've got here. All right. Thailand factory number two. Own the factory. You know that. You tell me. What was number one? Tight. Move to a country where you got protection. Number two, own the factory. Isn't it? Own the factory. All right, joint venture. Number three, customization. So then it doesn't matter. Number four, owner. Number two is a black box. Number two is a black box. All right, let's have a look. All right, own the factory. Okay. Yeah, black box, you're right. Customize, iDummy, equity share, Ambi Climate, startup community, Rotorex, community shaming. There are one, two, three, four, five, six ways of protecting your IP as taught by startups that I have interviewed. No lawyers, no contract will protect your IP. This is what startups have to do because they don't have teams of lawyers. Sir, so I have a question for Rotorex. If the community shaming, if the product is already out, so how can community shaming can actually help to protect you? Oh, because the community was saying, oh, don't buy, don't buy this brand for this distributor. And then the distributor wasn't able to sell the drones because it went around, oh, don't buy from this brand. They've, got cop they've copied the uh, propellers of uh, Rotorex. But if they, uh, no, very, very tight. Remember, yeah. drone racing is a very, very close-knit community. All right, it's not just a general Facebook community here. This is, you know, these are geeks. That, that all they're interested in is that's all they want to do, right? And so it's a very tight-knit community. And so once they found out, you know, there's copies, then they stopped buying this brand. And so they went back to the factory. You know, the distributor told the factory, and the factory found out. Can it actually help IP? Sorry. Can it help who? As in to the IP laws as in... It became the protection. It stopped the factory from continuing to do what they do, like copy in the propellers. It stopped them because they weren't able to sell through this distributor because the community word went around, don't buy this brand. Ah. Okay, so six and six. We're nearly ready for our two presenters now. Uh, and